Welcome to another episode of the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm your host, Blair Hodges. This episode's a throwback to a lecture about the Book of Mormon delivered back in 2009 by Dr. Terrell Givens. It was the first of our biennial Laura F. Willis Center Book of Mormon lectures. You can read a transcript at maxwellinstitute.byu.edu or watch a filmed version on the Maxwell Institute's YouTube channel. Givens is a professor of literature and religion at the University of Richmond in Virginia, and he's published a number of important books in Mormon studies, including By the Hand of Mormon and People of Paradox. This particular lecture is an outgrowth of Givens' contribution to Oxford University Press's Very Short Introduction series, his book focused on the Book of Mormon. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, you can send them to Blair Hodges at byu.edu. Turn back my Magellan Please record this final sound The 19th century saw repeated calls for an authentic American Bible. Restorationist Walter Scott described the Second Great Awakening as rife with rumors of a new Bible. He probably didn't have Walt Whitman in mind, but Whitman considered his mission to be, quote, the great construction of the new Bible, and he thought he pulled it off with leaves of grass. Scott did not have Joseph Smith in mind either, but when the century's dust had settled, the Book of Mormon had emerged as the century's foremost claimant for that title. In my remarks tonight, I will have two principal points to make about the Book of Mormon's status as an American Bible, or more generally, as modern scripture. The first is this. The Book of Mormon emphasizes its own provenance in a way that deserves our closer attention. Indeed, provenance is the book's first and perhaps most important theme. This theme goes a long way to explain the structure of the Book of Mormon and its particular purpose as intended by its narrators. And second, the Book of Mormon fully engages familiar 19th century scriptural forms, terms, and categories only to subvert them and constitute them into an utterly new American Bible. I will address a few of these themes tonight. First, provenance. Read against the paradigm of Judeo-Christian scripture, the opening of the Book of Mormon is conspicuously unusual. The Book of Mormon opens with a series of sentences that claim and reaffirm one central point. The original story that we are reading was personally narrated and recorded by a man named Nephi. I, Nephi, make a record of my proceedings in my days, he writes. Then adds, I make a record in the language of my father. I make a record which I know is true. I make it with my own hand. I make it according to my knowledge. Why all this redundancy? Why such emphatic insistence on the literal origins of the record with Nephi's own hand? Clearly, unlike the impersonal voice with which Genesis opens the biblical account of creation, focusing as it does on cosmic history, epic events, and God's primal acts of creation, the Book of Mormon's first named author urgently presses upon his audience the very human, very local, and very historical nature of his narrative. It is as far removed from mythic beginnings and anonymous narratives as he can possibly make it. This is firsthand eyewitness history of local events set in 600 BC Jerusalem, we learn shortly. It is a beginning also strikingly unlike the Gospels of the New Testament. None of the authors of the four Gospels, as certain critics delight to point out, identify themselves in their account of Jesus. There is no, I, Matthew, proceed to give an account of one Jesus of Nazareth, or I, Mark, write this narrative of the Christ. Some of these critics, in fact, find the unstipulated authorship of the Gospels to be a blow against their authenticity or credibility. Of course, we could read their silence differently. The anonymity of those four books seems almost calculated to emphasize the infinitely greater significance of the Christ who is the focus of their narratives. The authors themselves disappear in deference to the Messiah they proclaim. But the Book of Mormon, by contrast, begins with a personal introduction of the book's first author, I, Nephi. We need to ask why. To say it is because he is beginning a family history is, we shall see, insufficient as an explanation. 
True enough, Nephi is a self-described record keeper who believes God has called him to maintain an account of his clan. He gradually comes to an awakening of his record's importance and its future mission, and of his own inability to personally steer and shepherd his work to its intended audience, an audience that he only vaguely apprehends. This preoccupation with audience and with self-authentication in the face of his inability to control the fate of his written words and the terms of their reception weighs upon Nephi like a sacred burden. He cannot make any claims for the record's future disposition, but he can attest to its past, its origins. Hence, the motif that Nephi deliberately decides to foreground is the motif of the record's provenance, and his concern is to make it indisputable. In art history, provenance means derivation. More fully, it refers to authenticity that is secured in a particular way, establishing the true origins of an object by verifying its unbroken history of transmission from original owner to the present. In the Book of Mormon, we never lose sight of the links in this chain of transmission. This fact is no coincidence. And to make sense of the otherwise peculiar series of perfunctory and yet dutiful handoffs that Nephi's descendants make to each successor. For after Nephi, each inheritor of the plates of ore attests to this unbroken chain of transmission, calling the responsibility to continue this tradition a commandment passed on through the generations. The weight of solemn obligation felt by these chroniclers is evident in their clear attestations of a responsibility both executed and then transferred to the next. And this explains the curious feature of the Book of Mormon's structure, this series of mini-books that follow upon the heels of Enos's record. The accounts of Nephi, Jacob, and Enos are progressively shorter, and that of Enos's son Jerem is only two pages, making it the shortest of all books named for their authors, with the exception of the words of Mormon. Following Jerem's brief account, the succeeding chronicles are too short to even constitute books. In one case, that of Chemish, his stewardship takes the form of a single paragraph. This perfunctory brevity and the self-confessed wickedness of authors like Omni make the whole section seem somehow too mechanical, almost pointless. Why do they so dutifully fulfill their roles when their hearts seem so little invested in record-keeping? And why do editors Nephi and Mormon alike leave those portions intact? A terribly important point hinges on these questions, for it is precisely this very brevity. It is the dutiful but soulless nature of some of these entries that points all the more powerfully to the intimidating magnitude of the obligation the authors have inherited to maintain intact the line of transmission, the authentication of the provenance of the sacred records. This is the message conveyed loudly and clearly by the economical chemist. Now I, Chemish, write what few things I write in the same book with my father. For behold, I saw the last which he wrote, and he wrote it with his own hand. And he wrote it in the day that he delivered them unto me. And after this manner, we keep the records, for it is according to the commandments of our fathers. So that is the first detail of the Book of Mormon to which I would draw attention. The authorial preoccupation, almost obsessive concern with authenticating the record's provenance we are never permitted to lose sight of a documented genealogy that extends back in time, not to an anonymous author or an implied Moses or even a pseudepigraphal writer, but through a meticulously documented lineage to a historical personage of flesh and blood who fashioned out of his own hands the very materials on which the record was engraven. And from those hands going forward through a thousand years to Moroni. And one can now see the bridge from Moroni to Joseph Smith that is created by the sworn affidavits of 11 men as following in this same path of confirming with legalistic documentation the still unbroken history of the record's provenance. That is why, even though the final form these plates take is a printed volume and is now mass-produced, each copy nonetheless inherits the same pedigree, and each volume must therefore be seen as a sacred artifact a holy icon, from the moment the first copy came off the Palmyra Press. This is the final meaning of the book's ironclad guarantee of provenance. 
Aaron's budding rod was not a horticultural treasure. The pot of manna was not a culinary relic. And the Book of Mormon's primary function has never been textual. It is oracular. <clears throat> a very accomplished scholar of Mormonism has continued to insist that no one will take Mormonism's theology seriously until Mormons learn to mythologize their Book of Mormon. That remark fails to appreciate the very dimension to the Book of Mormon that I have just indicated. For this aspect of the Book of Mormon, so self-consciously and pointedly constructed by its narrators, is stubbornly resistant to such acts of dislocation from history and from its author. Why is this unbroken chain of transmission so important? Because that is how the narrator of this record enacts, rather than describes, an uninterrupted connection to the divine that transcends centuries and continents. The Book of Mormon, precisely because of the testimony of its own provenance, functions in a way best captured by the imagery of George Herbert's magnificent poem, The Pearl. Through the labyrinths of this world, the poet writes, addressing his God, not my groveling wit, but thy silk twist let down from heaven to me doth both conduct and teach me how by it to climb to thee. In its own self-portrayal, the Book of Mormon functions as that silk twist let down from heaven. Now if we move on to the content rather than the structure of this work, we find something thematically at work that reinterprets and does not just reenact this meaning of scripture as sacred contact with the divine. This new scriptural identity I want to explore is based upon, even as it creatively restructures, familiar biblical elements. That is what I mean by my reference to the radicalizing of the familiar. As illustration, I will draw attention to just four examples, four motifs in particular in the Book of Mormon, Revelation, Christology, Zion, and Scripture. It is no coincidence, I believe, that each of these topics is introduced by successive visionary experiences of Lehi. We know virtually nothing for certain of Lehi or his background, except that he is a person of wealth, and as his wife laments and Lehi agrees, is a visionary man. His first recorded vision occurs as Lehi is praying with all his heart on behalf of his people. Strangely, this is the only one of Lehi's visions about whose content we are told nothing at all. Nephi simply reveals that as Lehi prays, there came a pillar of fire, and he saw and heard much. No details of the message, no particulars of any message are available to distract from the fact of the visitation itself, given to a man who shares neither the public prestige nor, so far as we can tell, the national stewardship of his contemporary Jeremiah. What we do have is the sheer fact of a personal revelation. <clears throat> Apparently containing images and words, that comes as a result of petitionary prayer and profoundly affects the recipient. This definition of revelation as propositional or content-bearing will become one of the dominant themes of the Book of Mormon, even as it is manifest in the lives of a broadening range of recipients. Immediately following Lehi's first vision, he returns to his home and experiences a second. This one takes the form initially of a theophany, a vision of God, and calls to mind the divine assembly described in Old Testament passages and psalms <clears throat> or chronicles. Lehi sees God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God, but then follows a sight that is, is decidedly without Old Testament precedent. And it came to pass that he saw one descending from the midst of heaven, and he beheld that his luster was above that of the sun at noonday. Christians have not shrunk from reading messianic prophecies into the Psalms or passages from Isaiah and Zechariah. But nothing biblical approaches the degree of specificity with which Book of Mormon prophets and writers detail their anticipation of a Christ six centuries before his birth. Following this vision, which includes foreshadowings of the destruction of Jerusalem, Lehi preaches repentance to an unreceptive populace. Like Jeremiah's exhortations, which led to his persecution and imprisonment, Lehi's public war warnings prompt threats against his life. Consequently, he receives a third vision wherein God commands him to take his family and flee into the wilderness. So we now have the third theme. Lehi promptly complies, 
setting in motion the principal action of the early Book of Mormon, the family's journey to and settlement of a new world. This exodus also establishes a structural motif as the first of many hegiras the Book of Mormon records. Flight from old Jerusalem and building new ones, scattering and gathering, covenantal integrity in the midst of apostasy, dispersion in the land of promise, all these constitute variants of the Book of Mormon's recurring theme of building Zion in the wilderness. After a journey of three days, Lehi and his family make camp. There in the wilderness south of Jerusalem, he has a fourth dream vision in which he is commanded to send his four sons to Jerusalem to secure a record of the Jews together with a family genealogy inscribed on plates of brass. This is a formidable challenge. Twice the brothers fail, almost losing their lives. Nephi returns a third time and succeeds, but only through the extreme measure of killing a drunken and helpless Laban at the persistent urging of the spirit. The cost and expense, effort, and human life demonstrates and justifies a profound valuation of scripture, a concept that comes to be developed in the Book of Mormon in ways very unlike its Catholic and Protestant parallels. I will point out as an aside that in Lehi's magnificent vision of the tree of life, these four themes are all recapitulated and interwoven. But let me now examine each in more detail to show how they take the familiar that Joseph Smith's initial audience would have recognized and fashion them into something quite new. The first is revelation. Emil Brunner has written... God's revelation of himself always occurs in such a way as to manifest more deeply his inaccessibility. All that we can know is the world. God is not the world. He is mystery. Another contemporary religious scholar finds this a dominant motif in Christian thought, saying, the history of theology is replete with this truth. Recall Augustine's insight that if we have understood, then what we have understood is not God. Anselm's argument that God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Hildegard's vision of God's glory as living light that blinded her. Aquinas' working rule that we can know that God is and what God is not, but not what God is. Luther's stress on the hiddenness of God's glory. Simone Weil's conviction that there is nothing that resembles what she can conceive of when she says the word God. Sally McFaig's insistence on imaginative leaps into metaphor since no language about God is adequate. This is not the God of the Book of Mormon. In the Book of Mormon, God is not mystery. He is fully knowable, accessible, and susceptible to petitionary prayer. The Book of Mormon opens upon a scene of prophets and prophecy set in a time of extreme national peril. This is the world of Jeremiah, vintage Old Testament drama, epic in scope and sense of looming threat. But then notice how, very abruptly, everything changes Within pages, the focus shifts from the city of Jerusalem and her inhabitants to the destiny of one man, Lehi and his family. From national destinies hanging in the balance, we go to a family in crisis. But ironically, in the process of this narrowing of focus, the manifestations of divine communication with which the record opened are not diminished, but multiplied. This shift of direction from a public prophet advocating national repentance for the sake of collective survival in the face of geopolitical crisis to a father contending for the preservation of his sons and daughters in the wilderness perfectly exemplifies the Book of Mormon's tendency to invoke familiar categories and settings only to abruptly shift the ground from under our feet. Yes, the Old Testament also has its family sagas with warring siblings, but with a crucial difference. Because in the Old Testament, the Cains and Abels, the Isaacs and Esau's are largely etiologies, explanatory types who represent or explain larger human destinies. And the revelation that guides them guides the enormous currents of human history and cosmic understanding. Writes one scholar of the subject, prophecy in the Old Testament was the privilege of prophets. Prophecy, writes Abraham Heschel, is the exegesis of existence from a divine perspective. In the Book of Mormon, this is most emphatically not the case. Prophecy and revelation contract into the sphere of the quotidian, the personal, the immediate, where they proliferate and flourish. There are indications that the writers of the Book of Mormon intended the prevailing moral of the book to be, in fact, an openness to radically individualistic and literalistic conceptions of divine communication to mortals, dialogic revelation. This is the kind of revelation we saw in the Old Testament in Moses' encounter with God on Mount Sinai, 
or in Abraham's prolonged exchange with God over the fate of Sodom, where they haggle over numbers like a housewife and a bazaar merchant. These exchanges, figurative or mythical as they may be to today's readers, are certainly portrayed in anthropomorphic terms understood literally by the writer. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communion with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. He writes at the conclusion of the latter episode, as if human language and human paradigms of interaction were perfectly adequate to describe prophetic negotiations with the divine. The major thrust of the Book of Mormon is an elaboration of this model of revelation, expanding and extending it to lesser mortals and more intimate concerns. It is most dramatically revealed as a radical departure from Old Testament norms in the story of Lehi's dream. Nephi's father, Lehi, has a magnificent vision of a tree of life resplendent with allegorical details, extensive symbolism, and several elements of eschatology. In the aftermath of this father's vision, Nephi goes to the Lord in prayer, desiring that he also may behold the things which his father saw. The Spirit of the Lord appears to him and at first leaves him in possible doubt as to the propriety of his request. Does he not believe his father's account? Why then ask for his own version? Assured by Nephi that he does indeed trust the words of his father, the prophet and patriarch Lehi, the spirit breaks into a song of rejoicing and blesses Nephi for seeking his personal revelatory experience. Nephi then records his version of this vision, which exceeds even his father's in points of detail. Anyone reading this text in the 19th century or our own would have encountered a paradigm shift of dramatic proportions. This is why from Alexander Campbell's first protest against the Book of Mormon in 1830 to an evangelical's recent book on Mormonism, Moroni 10 has been singled out as that aspect of Mormon thought which is non-negotiable and utterly rejected. Second, Christology. According to Joseph Smith, when the angel Moroni first appeared to him with a commission to retrieve and translate the Book of Mormon, The angel reported that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in the plates, but added this enigmatic clause, as delivered by the Savior to the ancient American inhabitants. Such a formulation seems almost calculated to combine shocking novelty with a kind of raw nonchalance. He might as well have said, it contains the the record that the record affirmed the Ten Commandments, you know, the ones God delivered to Atlantis. The angel's perplexing description foreshadows the very pattern that I'm trying to unpack, that the Book of Mormon oscillates between the cliched and the heretical, between the pedestrian and the preposterous. Many claims surrounding the Book of Mormon, its inscription on plates of gold, its delivery to Joseph Smith by an angel, its miraculous translation, Searstone, German, Thelma, these are remarkable to say the least. But the most striking claim within the Book of Mormon is undoubtedly its insistence that Jesus Christ was worshipped in the Western Hemisphere by way of anticipation six centuries before his birth. The two questions that such an assertion immediately invite are, first, how detailed was this Nephite knowledge of the Christ? And more to the point, how did a group of ancient Israelites exhibit such an emphatic and detailed knowledge of Jesus when their Jewish contemporaries had at best vaguely defined notions of a Messiah to come? The Book of Mormon seems in this regard as something we could read as a pseudepigraphal response to the tantalizing possibilities suggested by the Apostle Peter when he wrote, the prophets pondered and tried to find out what was the time and what the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them pointed, foretelling the sufferings in store for Christ. The church historian Eusebius argued many centuries ago that Moses was enabled by the Holy Spirit to foresee quite plainly the title Jesus, evident, he thinks, in his successor's name, Joshua. Most Christians, however, see such biblical typology as inspired foreshadowings apparent only in hindsight. In the case of the Book of Mormon, by contrast, the references are clear and unobscured by allegory, symbolism, or cryptic allusion. Christology in the Book of Mormon is not an occasional intrusion, but it's the narrative backbone of the whole story and the dramatic point of orientation. All of Book of Mormon history, in other words, pivots on the moment of Christ's coming. Its narrative centrality is emphasized by describing the steadfastness and travails of those who anticipate the messianic moment 
the utopian era of those who keep the coming and its significance in memory, and the rapid decline and degeneration of those who do not. Book of Mormon prophets even established their own chronology around his coming. <clears throat> One principal critique that the Enlightenment made of Christianity was the historical particularity of the incarnation and ministry of Christ. Why, they asked, would a god of the entire human race confine his earthly manifestation to only a fortunate few living in proximity to a Jewish village? That's a good question, we could add. Such criticism had been anticipated centuries earlier when Christians developed a doctrine of Prisca Theologia, holding that versions of the gospel were transmitted imperfectly to other peoples and cultures, affording even pagans partial glimpses of gospel truth. But the Book of Mormon suggests a much more radical corrective. When Christ presents his own ministry to the Nephites as but one in a series of proliferating manifestations of his gospel and even of his personal presence. Ye are they of whom I said, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. And verily I say unto you that I have other sheep which are not of this land, neither of the land of Jerusalem, neither any parts of that land round about whither I have been to minister. So in the Book of Mormon we find familiar allusions to a Christ we thought we knew, but instead of a single unparalleled eruption of the divine into the human, we have in the Book of Mormon a proliferation of historical iterations, which collectively become the ongoing substance rather than the shadow of God's dealings in the past. So for the third time, second time, we see here a familiar topic, central to Christian culture, introduced only to be fashioned into a version that moves in directions exactly opposite to readerly expectation. Third, Zion. The Puritans who settled America would see themselves as exiles from the old world, figurative Israelites who were guided to this promised land to establish a spiritual Zion. The early Christian saga involves movement from the covenant of blood extended to a chosen tribe to the covenant of adoption, which creates a community of believers. It changes from gathering in real space, centered in a literal Zion, to a spiritual gathering that constitutes a figurative body in Christ. The Book of Mormon reenacts the former model, even as it anticipates the latter Christian model. For the Book of Mormon is the record of a people's repeated quests for a land of promise and their anxiety about their covenantal status before God, even as it insistently repeats the theme that as many of the Gentiles as will repent, they are the covenant people of the Lord. I think it is only in this context of anxiety about covenants and Zion that the dominant emotional tone of the Book of Mormon has a recognizable resonance. The Book of Mormon begins with an event that must have been traumatic to the principal actors in the drama, Exodus. Not an exodus from bondage and wilderness exile to the land of promise, but exodus away from the land of promise, away from Jerusalem, away from the people of the covenant, from the temple, and into the wilderness. That is why the form of so much of Nephi's preaching in the early days of exile is reassurance and consolation. He invokes Isaiah repeatedly precisely in order to convince his people that they are a remnant of the house of Israel and that even though they're broken off, they may have hope as well as their brethren. A thousand years later, at the conclusion of the record, Moroni reaffirms this message by giving it pride of place on his title page. This sacred record is to show unto the remnant of the house of Israel that they are not cast off forever. This lesson, the portability of Zion, is reenacted so many times in the Book of Mormon that it becomes a leitmotif. Lehi erects an altar in the wilderness and makes of his exile a sacred refuge. After a terrifying sea voyage, the clan becomes established in the promised land, but their dissension immediately breaks out, and Nephi is directed to again flee into the wilderness and reestablish a remnant a remnant of the original remnant. A few hundred years later, the Lord directs a subsequent king, Mosiah, to depart from there into the wilderness with as many as would hearken. Arrived in Zarahemla, Mosiah and his people encounter another remnant for, from Jerusalem who journeyed in the wilderness to this new world, Zion. Other iterations of this theme will include the newly converted Alma the Elder's flight from the court of King Noah and his founding of a church in the wilderness. And yet another people descended from old world exiles who crossed the sea in barges after being commanded to go forth into the wilderness at the time of Babel. Most poignantly of all, 
the record will close with the spectacle of a lonely Moroni, sole survivor of his race, finding in his wilderness exile that he has neither family, friends, nor whither to go, the successive chain of Zion building finds its definitive end, and the record closes. The Book of Mormon may be seen in this light as the story of the unending transmission of the gospel into new contexts, which I think should have powerful resonance as the church anticipates becoming a truly international entity. The story of an unending transmission of the gospel into new contexts, a chronicle of the volatility and fragility of lands of refuge, a testament of the portability and ceaseless transmutations of Zion, with the only constant being the eternally present promise of a special relationship to God and direct access to his power and truth. The original dislocation signified by Lehi's exodus becomes a prelude not, as they anticipated, to a new geographical gathering, but a shadow of the permanent reconstitution of Zion into spiritual refuge. The resonance of this theme for early American descendants of those who had embarked on their own errand into the wilderness would have been unmistakable. And the theme would undoubtedly have had special poignance for the first readers of the Book of Mormon, 19th century religious refugees who persisted doggedly and tragically in attempts to realize their own earthly Zions in a trail from Ohio through Missouri to Illinois and the Great Basin. Fourth and finally, scripture. After explaining the origins of this record that will eventually comprise the Book of Mormon and establishing his intent to write nothing save it be sacred, Nephi goes about reconstituting or constituting his record in a way that is markedly different from simple prophetic utterance or inspired dictate. He constitutes his record as a kind of bricolage or assembly of already existing pieces into a new mosaic. In doing so, he reinforces a conception of scripture as something fluid, diffuse, infinitely generable, the very opposite of scripture as something unilaterally concretized, fixed in a canon. The first eight chapters of his record, Nephi characterizes as a summation of a record his father kept. His own record commences with the details leading up to his vision of the tree of life. He then assimilates into his account a number of other prophetic voices unknown to us, Zenic. Neum, Zenus. He then progresses to the prophecies of Isaiah, which he has obtained from another set of plates. Not content to merely cite him, Nephi incorporates into his narrative entire swaths of Isaiah. The dynamic, vibrant life of scripture is something that is generated, assimilated, transformed, and transmitted in endless ways and in ever new context is clearly indicated in those scenes where Nephi centers in on his commission to produce a sacred record. But the theme achieves its most pronounced instance well into the subsequent narrative, at a time when a repentant sinner, Alma, living among a heathen people far removed from the God-fearing Nephites, begins, surprisingly enough, to preach Christ to his peers. But how did Alma obtain a knowledge of Christ? He had heard the preaching of Abinadi, an itinerant prophet martyred by a wicked king called Noah. And Alma did write all the words which Abinadi had spoken. Where did Abinadi, who appears suddenly in the narrative with no background or introduction, get that knowledge? Well, in chapters 13 and 14 of another section of the Book of Mormon, Mosiah, we find him reading from some unnamed text, the words of Moses and of Isaiah to Noah's court, and finding in them clear foreshadowing of a God who, would, who should come down among the children of men. Whence did Abinadi obtain those scriptures? Well, he was a member of a colony founded by one Zenith, an offshoot of the major Nephite settlement, whose founders took copies of the Nephite records with them when they departed Zarahemla. And those Nephite records, before even leaving Jerusalem at the record's beginning, Nephi and his brothers abscond with the brass plates of Laban, etc., etc., etc. So we have a clear line of transmission from prophetic utterance to brass plates, to Nephi's small plates, to Zenith's copy, to Abinadi's gloss, to Alma's transcription. And that is only half the story. From Alma, these teachings become a part of his record, written record. When they arrive back in Zarahemla, the Nephite king reads them to the assembled people there. As guardian of the large plates, he incorporates the record into his record. They are subsequently abridged by Moroni, finally attaining the form they have today. One might object that the Book of Mormon itself cannot embody such an organic, 
constantly evolving and morphing canon without self-contradiction. It was, after all, given its final and definitive form in 1830. But the Book of Mormon undermines its own pretensions to simply reenact or supplement the Bible by situating itself along with that Bible as one in an endless series of scriptural productions. As the Book of Mormon's God says, I shall speak unto the Jews, and they shall write it, unto the Nephites, and they shall write it, to the tribes of the house of Israel, and they shall write it, and unto the nations of all the earth, and they shall write it. The themes and strategies which I have surveyed tonight convey something of the ways in which the Book of Mormon exploited the materials of the biblical text and a biblical culture to fashion a work that was, as the designation Golden Bible implied, both alien and recognizable, sacred and profane at the same time. In this regard, the Book of Mormon mirrors Mormonism's own peculiar synthesis of opposites. For Mormonism as a church provides a very interesting case study of how a modern church tries to successfully negotiate a synthesis of modern science and biblical literalism, intellectual credibility and folk magic beginnings, how it has been managing the critics notwithstanding to persist in basing its theology on a history that is intractably, intractably, intractably and conspicuously vulnerable. I hope to have shown in this regard that the Book of Mormon's place as canonical scripture cannot be separated from the particular ways in which it has portrayed itself as a literal historical creation and from the unexpected ways it has both engaged and rewritten important strands of Christian historical understanding. All this strikes me as a remarkably novel way to think about scripture, unlike the Bible or the Quran which constitute the bases of their respective faiths' doctrines. The Book of Mormon grounds virtually none of those principles or practices unique to the LDS faith. Pre-existence of human souls, the eternity of the family, a multi-tiered heaven, vicarious ordinances for the dead, the Mormon code of health, the law of tithing, a modern church organized under a prophet and 12 apostles, none of these distinctives appear in the Book of Mormon. No, it is the way the Book of Mormon challenges its audience to rethink their relationship to the divine, their place in Christian history and God's relationship to history that is the point. In this capacity as a sign or pointer to meaning outside itself, the Book of Mormon was one of a panoply of heavenly portents that signaled the commencement of a new dispensation. During that first generation in which the Book of Mormon appeared, theophanies, angels, gold plates, Nephite interpreters, magic compasses, the whole entourage of otherworldly visitants, and priestly articles were like the vibrant, extravagant uncials in an illuminated manuscript, drawing attention to the inauguration of a new chapter in God's conversation with man, conspicuous heralds of another revelation, of a fresh deluge of heavenly light. Had Joseph Smith, or God, intended the Book of Mormon to be read and evaluated on its own merits, then Joseph could have presented it as as an ancient text he had simply discovered and translated, as James McPherson had done with Ossian so successfully a few years earlier. Or he could have produced a volume of inspired writings and left his audience to gauge the extent of that inspiration, as would Mary Baker Eddy. He could even have claimed the second sight and described civilizations ancient and exotic or like Emanuel Swedenborg, spiritual. In any of these cases, the text itself would have been separable from the author, and his claims to himself be the portal of a new gospel dispensation. But a wealth of data, Smith's sermons and editorials, contemporary accounts, early missionary journals, all confirm that Joseph was relentless and adamant in presenting the story of the Book of Mormon's reception and translation as the paramount sign of his prophethood, even as he distanced himself and potential readers from what lay between its covers. He never sermonized from it. He virtually never quoted it. After its publication, he never demonstrated intimate knowledge of its content or storyline or themes. It is as if, like a court stenographer, he felt the text flow through him without taking full cognizance of it. There is no evidence that he studied the Book of Mormon after its publication, except to make the most minor of grammatical changes. Similarly, early missionaries like William McClellan and Wandel Mace record in their journals how they would read to potential converts the testimonies of the 11 witnesses, affirming the reality of the gold plates and Joseph's prophetic powers of translation, 
but they do not indicate that they ever employed the text of the Book of Mormon itself as a basis for discussion, catechism, or conversion. During the seven years of the church's Nauvoo period, when Joseph was preaching in public on a regular basis, the hundreds of recorded pages of his sermons contain only a handful of brief allusions to the Book of Mormon, and none of them involve sustained discussion of its doctrine or content. This, then, is the role the Book of Mormon played and continues to play predominantly in the life of the church it launched. It had other lives and functions I have not had time to explore, It compelled interest on the part of 19th century audiences because it claimed to solve the mystery of American Indian ancestry. To restorationists, it translated the primitive Christianity of the New Testament into language that was plain and simple and resonated with the newness of American contexts. For other future converts, it served to distinguish the claims of Mormonism from a host of kindred newcomers, all crowding the religious landscape. Ultimately, however, the Book of Mormon was invoked in logic and language that persists to the present moment as a sign that pointed outside itself with manifest authority and convincing materiality to larger processes and events underway. In its own position as a third testament, the real burden of the Book of Mormon was to provide a compelling genealogy, not of Christ back to Abraham or the human family back to Adam, it attested to its own genealogy in a chain of authenticity traceable from God's first command to Nephi through a thousand years of providential history to a hillside in upstate New York when a young Joseph resurrected it from a stone tomb. Like Herbert's silken twist let down from heaven, or like Jacob's ladder along which angels ascended and descended, the Book of Mormon serves believers as a concrete conduit that connects them to a divine source along which sacred energies flow in both directions. As such, it functions not just as witness, but as tangible embodiment of God's living word, manifest in the continuing production of scripture through prophets who still walk the earth. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Let your friends know they can download episodes from maxwellinstitute.byu.edu or in iTunes. Sound of